So what happens to priests when they get in trouble? If you've been following the scandal coming from the Pennsylvania grand jury report, or even going back to McCarrick, uh, and now with the allegations released by Archbishop Vigano, uh, we have all these people on Twitter, Facebook, mostly saying these men need to be defrocked. Defrocked. And then people have been asking, well, what does that mean? You'll also hear it, see the word laicization. And you also see suspension or suspended ad divinis. And a lot of people are asking, what do these words mean? And how does all of this work? And how do we get bad bishops or bad priests or even bad deacons ejected from pastoral care? And so today I want to look at the three words that we see the most common. That is the word defrocked, laicization, and suspended ad divinis. So we're going to look at canon law and find out what these words mean. Now, in canon law... There's really only two categories. There's um, being removed from the clerical state. This is called laicization. And then there's suspension or suspended ad divinis. There is no canonical term for defrocked. Defrocked is actually a term that goes way back hundreds of years. It refers to the frock. A frock is a dress, a gown, or robes. And so when a priest is defrocked, he's no longer allowed to wear the robes the cassock, or present himself publicly uh, or at all as a priest. And so the term defrocked is misleading because you'll read in, you know, the New York Times or in papers or periodicals that such and such priest was defrocked. And whenever I see that, I'm not sure if they're referring to laicization or was he suspended. Usually the term defrocked means laicized, and that means removed from the clerical state. So Let's take a look at canon law of what it says about removal from the clerical state. All right, so we find ourselves at canon 290, and this is under the subheading loss of the clerical state. And it says, sacred ordination, once validly received, never becomes invalid. What this means is when a man is ordained a priest, he receives an indelible character on his soul for the rest of eternity whether he's in heaven or hell, he will have the mark on his soul of being a Catholic priest. There's nothing that a man can do to ever lose his Catholic priesthood. He can commit a billion mortal sins. He can even go into perdition in hell, but he remains a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek as a representative of Jesus Christ, whether he's good or bad. And this goes back to the early church, the Donatist heresy, where the Catholic Church defended that even clerics who committed grave mortal sin, even apostasy, were still valid priests. The reason that this is a good, good thing is, you know, think if you're a priest committed a mortal sin on Saturday night, he shows up on Sunday morning, well, if he lost his priesthood somehow, that means you're not getting the true body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Or you're not getting a true absolution and confession. So, for the sake of the salvation of souls, Christ set it up so that priesthood would be indelible. It could not be taken away. Continuing Canon 290. The second part says, A cleric, however, loses the clerical state, and then it lists some conditions. Uh, by a judgment of the court, the penalty of dismissal lawfully imposed, by a rescript of the apostolic see. Um, and all of this is referring to what we call as laicization. Now, when a man loses the clerical state, he's still a priest in his soul, but he can never again wear the collar. He can't wear the cassock. He can never say mass publicly or privately. He can't hear confessions. He can't do baptisms. He can't do anything. The exception is when there is danger of death. So let's say there was a laicized priest. He hasn't worn the collar or been called father for 25 years, and he sees a wreck and recognizes a fellow Catholic there who's dying, he can go and do a, a confession and absolve the man in the danger of death. But otherwise, this man has been removed from the clerical state, and this means that he can also now marry, he can contract a marriage, and he's no longer obliged to uh, recite the divine office, the liturgy of the hour. So he is what you would say, you know, in common language, I don't like the term, defrocked. But the better term is laicization, or here in canon law, loss of the clerical state. 
Now, the other kind of penalty that can be placed upon a cleric, upon our clergy, is suspension. And suspension means that they retain their clerical identity, but either all or part of their ministry is suspended. Usually we see the term suspended a divinis. A divinis here is Latin, a from, and then divinis is ablative, plural, from divine things. And what are those divine things? Primarily the sacraments, but also preaching. So let's look at canon law on this. Or right, I'm looking at canon 1333, and it lists it as suspension, which can affect only clerics. So you can't suspend a layman, but you can suspend a bishop, a priest, and a deacon. And this suspension affects not only the power of holy orders, as we see right there in that first bullet point, but also the power of governance. So let's say, for example, a archbishop was suspended. He would lose um, the power of government, governance over those under his care of souls. And also in this section, it states that the suspension can have limits. And if we jump down to Canon 1335, I'll read this. It says, quote, if a censure prohibits the celebration of the sacraments or sacramentals or the exercise of a power of governance, the prohibition is suspended whenever this is necessary to provide for the faithful who are in danger of death. So again, in danger of death, if a priest is suspended, he can provide sacraments. Now in a suspension ad divinis, the man continues to wear the collar. He continues to be father or deacon or bishop, archbishop, cardinal, but he is limited on the celebration of the sacraments. So for a priest, well, for deacon, that would mean no baptisms and marriages. For priests, it would include baptism and marriage, but also mass, confession, anointing of the sick. And for a bishop, that means that if he were suspended fully, that bishop would not be allowed, according to canon law, to offer confirmation or holy orders or to administer the sacramentals, um, such as to create um, chrism or oil for the sick, oil for the catechumens, uh, etc., so the important take home here is that when penalties are imposed on our clergy, they come twofold, as we've stated. Laicization, removal of the clerical state, that is the strictest. That means this man is out on the street, he's living in an apartment, he's not on clerical property, he's not wearing a collar, he has been stripped down, he's still a priest forever, ontologically, metaphysically, but he has no public identity or even private identity, identity as a priest. And then suspension ad divinis can be temporary, it can be lifelong, and that is removing the priest's powers, either publicly or completely, so that he can no longer function as a priest. And we see this sometimes when a priest is accused or he's under, you know, so within a scandal, uh, his bishop or his, his superior will suspend him for a time until things can get settled. And then if it turns out to be, in fact, a grave case and he's guilty, he is suspended fully. Sometimes if the, if the crime is so bad, he will be laicized or the man himself will, recre re or the man himself will request laicization. Another time, just to close, for laicization is when a man's in the priesthood and he says, uh, I've discerned that this is not my vocation. I've made a mistake. I want to leave the priestly life and I want to go get married. In those cases, sometimes the church will grant that priest laicization. So he remains a priest forever, but he can never call himself father, wear the collar, say mass, or do any of the sacraments. He has lost the clerical state. So those are the canonical penalties that can be levied against a cleric, whether Archbishop Vigano is going to be suspended by Pope Francis for publishing his testimony. I don't know. Sounds like speculation. Sounds like gossip. But it's important for us as we look at others like McCarrick or like Whirl, what should be applied to them? Suspension? Laicization? These are questions that everyone needs to be discussing. And what is the penalty for a priest when he rapes a minor or even engages in sexual encounters with other adults? Does that entail cover-up, suspension, laicization? These are questions that we need to, to know and we need to talk about. And also, I think as you're talking with people and you hear the word defrocked, that's a good opportunity, it's a good teaching moment to introduce these concepts of laicization versus suspension 
And I think it's best for us to back away from the word defrocked and just use those two terms because that gets us into canon law and into clarity. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you're enjoying these videos, and there's a lot of videos I've been doing in the last couple weeks on the McCarrick scandal, on the World scandal, on the grand jury report in Pennsylvania, uh, the Vigano scandal, or testimony rather, uh, and then responses or lack of response by Pope Francis. If you like all that and you want more information, please hit the subscribe button, like this video, and you can also listen to this uh, podcast audio style over on iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify, however you consume podcasts and audio resources. Again, thanks so much. My name is Dr. Taylor Marshall, and we'll see you in videos to come.